in the sixth century, a power would begin rising from the ashes of the Western Roman Empire. This power was symbolized by the clay infused in the feet of iron on Nebuchadnezzar's image. It was symbolized by a little horn who rose up among 10 other horns. It was symbolized by the beast that had the names of blasphemy on its head. And this power was symbolized by a woman that had mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, written on her forehead. Ladies and gentlemen, this power is none other than the Papal Roman Empire. then return and have indignation against the holy covenant so shall he do he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant the scripture says that after he returns that he will have indignation against the holy covenant the scripture then says that after he returns he will have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant now notice the first half of verse 30 talks about war but then the second half of verse 30 talks about the Holy Covenant. And students of prophecy, as students of prophecy, we must also be students of history. Because students of history should understand that not only did Justinian war or declare war against the barbarian tribes who had taken up residency within the Roman Empire in order to reconquer those territories that were previously part of the Roman Empire, but then after he declared war on these barbarian tribes, then he would take a keen interest in matters of religion. And it is this interest that would not only drive Emperor Justinian to have indignation against the Holy Covenant, but it would also drive him to have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Now, if we're talking about the Holy Covenant, we should ask the question, what is the Holy Covenant? The Holy Covenant is what scripture calls the New Covenant. And here is what the Bible says about the New Covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God. and They shall be to me a people. The New Covenant is with the house of Israel. And the house of Israel is essentially the New Testament church. And at its core, the new covenant is God placing his laws within our minds and then we become his people and he becomes our God. Now, what you must understand is that the least divergence from this objective is indignation against the holy covenant. And now we understand through the historical record how Justinian had this indignation against the Holy Covenant. The following statements are directed towards the Bishop of Rome by Emperor Justinian. We have exerted ourselves to unite all the priests of the East and subject them to the see of your holiness. We desire that all peoples subject to our benign empire shall live under the same religion that the divine Peter, the apostle, gave to the Romans. We order all those who follow this law to assume the name of Catholic Christians and consider others as demented and insane. Now, notice how the Bishop of Rome replies to Emperor Justinian. Among the conspicuous, yeah, you kind of need a dictionary to decipher what he's saying, but let's continue. Among the conspicuous reasons for praising your wisdom and gentleness 
most Christian of emperors, and one which radiates light as a star, is the fact that through love of the faith and actuated by zeal for charity, you, learned in ecclesiastical discipline, have preserved reverence for the sea of Rome, talking about himself, and have subjected all things to his authority and have given it unity. He goes on to say, this sea is indeed the head of all churches as the rules of the fathers and the decrees of emperors assert and the words of your most reverent piety testify, dot, dot, dot. Ladies and gentlemen, what you must understand is that in the year 533 AD, Justinian ordered all the empire to be Catholic. But what you also must understand is that in order to be Catholic, you had to submit to the Bishop of Rome. So what's wrong with submitting to the Bishop of Rome? The problem is, and I've said this on multiple, multiple occasions, is absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's one of the reasons why most modern nations shy away from having dictatorships. And that's because we have enough of a sample size to understand that when you give someone absolute power, it essentially corrupts them and they begin to use that power to further their own ends. And this is no different from the Bishop of Rome. When Justinian gave the Bishop of Rome absolute authority. Now, we must also understand that not everyone agreed with this absolute authority, but in the Bishop of Rome's mind, he had absolute authority and this would begin to evolve and eventually it would lead to the Bishop of Rome believing and having others believe that he was the vicar of Christ on earth. In other words, the representative of Christ on earth. And now we can understand how having the representative of Christ as a man on earth is, was the beginning of that indignation that was set up by Justinian in 533 AD. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, when you look at verse 31, I want you to look closely at it because there's three components to verse 31 that I want to bring out to you. Number one, arm shall stand on his part. Number two, they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. And number three, they shall take away the daily sacrifice and place the abomination that make it desolate. Now, let's understand what these three components are. Arms represents the power of the throne. And even though the emperor was really the power behind the throne, really behind the emperor was the armies of that empire that was really the power. So arms here represents armies. Now, the word sanctuary here could represent the heavenly sanctuary. However, when we combine the sanctuary with the word strength, it seems to take on a different connotation. You see, in the original language, that word strength is maos. And the book of Daniel seems to always translate this word as fort or fortified or stronghold. Now, what you must understand is that the heavenly sanctuary was never considered a fort or a fortified place. However, the city of Rome was. Thus, we see the sanctuary of strength was the church headquartered in Rome. Now, this point is extremely important because what you must understand is that the bishops of Rome pushed the idea that Peter was the first bishop of the city of Rome. Then they disseminated the idea that Peter was the head of all the church. And because Peter was the head of all the church and he was the first bishop of Rome, then therefore all other bishops within Rome would therefore be the head of the church. So therefore we understand Rome in a sense is where the bishops of Rome obtain their power because they're saying and the church believes that it is Rome that gives the bishops its authority over the rest of the church. Sacrifice is not part of the original text and was added by the translators. And if you haven't watched my video on the daily sacrifice, I highly recommend that you do. However, just real briefly, since the word sacrifice is not part of the text, we understand that the word daily really should be translated as the continuation. 
And the continuation is essentially the continuation of Israel, which today we know as the New Testament church. And then we understand that the abomination of desolation is the mixture of the holy and the profane, or it is a mixture of good and evil. Thus, you should understand that according to verse 31, we are looking at a time in history when an army stood for the Bishop of Rome. And number two, a time when the Bishop of Rome obtained the Church of Rome. And then number three, a time when the church was taken away and replaced by something that mixed the holy with the profane. Regarding these components, the historical record says that in 538 AD, Belisarius defeated the Goths and the Pope was placed in quiet possession of the capital of Rome. Here we see that in 538, Justinian's arms stood on the part of the Bishop of Rome. And it is here that we can see that the Bishop of Rome then received or polluted the Sanctuary of Strength or the Sanctuary of the Stronghold, which we now know is the Church in Rome. Now, once he received the church in Rome, what you must understand is that this, in this way, he received the church in the empire. And we know this because the historical record says that Justinian enriched himself with the property of all heretics, that is non-Catholics, and gave all their churches to the Catholics. And then he published edicts in 538, compelling all to join the Catholic church in 90 days or leave the empire and he confiscated all their goods. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you have to be thinking and you have to see and realize that the three components in verse in, in Daniel 11, verse 31 are the same three components in the second portion of Revelation 13 and verse two. Notice that it says, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. What you must understand is that John the Revelator's power is the same as Daniel's arms that stood on his part. What you must understand is that John the Revelator's seat is the same as the prophet Daniel's sanctuary of strength. And you must understand that John the Revelator's great authority is the same as the prophet Daniel's taking away the daily and replacing it with the abomination of desolation. And from all accounts, it appears that this time frame begins sometime in the mid 6th century, somewhere between 533 and 538 AD. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that this time frame began in the year 538 AD. Now, please understand that in the year 538, the Bishop of Rome didn't just automatically begin ruling like a king. You must understand that in the year 538, the Bishop of Rome didn't just start persecuting the saints automatically, nor did the Bishop of Rome start changing doctrines and mixing the holy with the profane immediately at the year 538. You must understand that all of these things came gradually. It needed to be manifested. It had to be taught. It had to be, it had to learn how to do this. And who was his teacher? Emperor Justinian. You see, in a way, as Emperor Justinian began to force his brand of Christianity upon the Roman Empire, he became the head of the church. And in a way, in essence, the Bishop of Rome began with Emperor Justinian. In, a, in effect, he was the pseudo pope before the Bishop of Rome took control. And under the rulership of Emperor Justinian, we see a transition occurring. You see, remember, Emperor Constantine began a paganism to Christianity transition in the fourth century. And now here in the sixth century, Emperor Justinian now is beginning a Christianity to papal Christianity transition. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And so here we have Constantine acting as a type of Pope, and he began persecuting the saints in the sixth century. And what you must understand is that his persecution didn't start off with torture. 
his persecution didn't start off with the death penalty. You see, what you must understand is that the persecution of all non-Catholics that began in the 6th century began with civil penalties. And here's what the historical record says. Now, among the Christians in the entire Roman Empire, there are many with dissenting doctrines, which are called heresies by the established church, such as those of the Montanists and Sabatians. I, I don't, I'm, I'm probably saying that wrong. Sabatins and whatever others cause the minds of men to wander from the truth path. All of these beliefs he ordered to be abolished and their place taken by the orthodox dogma, threatening among the punishments for disobedience, the loss of the heretic's right to will property to his children or other relatives. That's civil penalties, ladies and gentlemen, but let's read on. He goes on to say, as none of the previous emperors had molested these churches, many men, even those of the Orthodox faith, got their livelihood by working on their estates. But the emperor, but the emperor Justinian on confiscating these properties at the same time took away what for many people had been their only means of earning a living. Now, Emperor Justinian began punishing heretics. And in this manner, we could see that Emperor Justinian also threw out the baby with the bathwater because there were many who maybe didn't have heretical views, but they didn't view the papacy or the Bishop of Rome as the head of the Christian faith. And they were persecuted right along with all the other heretics. And now we can see how the papacy flourished and those who took on the name Catholic Christian were corrupted by flatteries. But the verse also mentions that there were those who knew their God. They understood that this forced religion that Emperor Justinian was placing upon the empire, they understood that this was not the true religion. And it is these individuals who were persecuted along with all the other heretics. But the Bible says that they were strong. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. In every age of persecution, you have individuals who stand up for what is right. And in the dark ages, we had people, God had a remnant of people who still attempted to follow all that they knew according to what the Bible says. And these people, according to scripture, are they that understood. And the notable of these individuals are what we now know today are reformers. They're not limited to, but they are inclusive of individuals like William Tyndall, individuals like John Calvin, people like John Wycliffe, people like John Huss, and people like Jerome of Prague. Now, it is important for you to see that the civil penalties initially placed upon non-Catholics for not wanting to be Catholic, transition eventually to corporal punishment. And here we must see that those who understood and them that followed them who understood would be persecuted according to scripture by sword, flame, and captivity, and spoil for many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Now after years upon years of papal domination, several reformers would rise up in protest of the Catholic Church. But here this verse points out one in particular, and that is Martin Luther. You see, in the year 1517, Martin Luther would rise up and he would protest the Catholic Church, nailing 95 theses or 95 statements against something called indulgences. And these indulgences were where the Catholic Church was charging individuals in order to place their loved ones in heaven. And so the only way that your loved one could get in heaven if they were in you know, hell or purgatory for that matter, is to pay 
the priest. And Martin Luther began protesting against these indulgences. And so he nailed 95 theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg. And this act would begin something called the Protestant Reformation. And these Protest, these individuals who began the Protestant Reformation would then be identified as Protestants. Now, not everyone would join this Protestant movement. Some individuals who most likely knew the truth would still cleave to the Roman Catholic Church because of the flatteries, because of the benefits and the security that being part of the Roman Catholic Church afforded them. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end. Yet it is yet for a time appointed. Now, even though the people of God were persecuted and killed, what I want you to understand is that in the eyes of God, these individuals who were martyred, they were seen as pure in God's eyes. And it is crazy to think that this time of persecution lasted for over a thousand years that means that there were people who were born and died and their life was their life consisted of essentially being persecuted from the moment they were born to the moment that they expired and thus we see that god had an appointed time that it would expire, and this time had not yet come yet. And thus we understand we're still in the middle of this 1260 year period. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that, that is determined shall be done. Now, here the king is the papacy. Now, even though the Eastern Roman Empire, or what was called then the Byzantine Empire, still existed as a level of authority within the Roman Empire, what we must understand is at this point, the papacy was now seen as the king. And thus we understand that even though the Byzantine Empire still had a ruler, the king was now transitioned and seen as the papacy and according to scripture this bishop of rome as the head of the papacy would rule for 1260 years but he would do so by exalting himself he would magnify himself above every other god and it is regarding this particular entity that the bible says who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the problem with the papal hierarchy is that they place the power or they place the authority of the church into the hands of one man. And this man who became the Pope would basically delegate more power to himself. And the next Pope would come and he would delegate more power to himself. And then the next Pope would come and he would delegate more power to himself. And then you got to the, to the place, ladies and gentlemen, where the Popes were actually deciphering who was gonna make it into heaven or hell. The priests were, for, you know, it was up to them to forgive sins. You know, they were placing Mary as, you know, you know as the mother of God and, you know, you know bringing, idols or images into the church and all types of things began happening and that's because the authority of the church was placed into the hands of a man instead of Jesus Christ. Now the reign of this power would last for 1260 years but we must understand that during this 1260 years there were times that emperors ruled over the popes and then there were some times that the popes ruled over kings. We also must understand that there were times where there were three popes ruling at the same time. And then there were probably times where there were no popes ruling at times. But ultimately, 
The rulership of the papacy would last for 1260 years. History confirms that papal domination would end officially in the year 1798 when Napoleon's general would come and capture the Pope and he would die in captivity. Now, notice I said officially, because what we must understand is that the power of the papacy had already been dying out long before 1798. 1798 was really the nail in the coffin. Now, just like there were bishops of Rome before 538 AD, there was another pope elected after 1798. But generally speaking, his civil authority began in 538 when he was placed in possession of the, of the city of Rome. And then it ended in 1798 where he was taken off the throne. I'm saying throne liberally. He was taken off the throne in the year 1798 and his power essentially ended civilly in that year, even though the church would keep on going. So here we understand that many people have different time frames for this 1260 year period and I'm okay with that. But generally speaking, I believe that we have enough evidence to suggest that this time period began in the year 538 AD and ended in the year 1798. Now, what many of you may not be aware of is that during the reign of the papacy, there was another power that was rising up in the South. And this power rising up in the South is part of our end time scenario. And I want to tell you about this empire so badly, but we're out of time. But I promise you that next week, you're going to find out about this empire when you tune in to the Daniel 11 Chronicles. Next week on the Daniel 11 Chronicles.